Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Contemporary Christ, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Ephesians 4, 11. We've already seen in looking at this passage together something of the reason why the church is so weak in so many places today, that it has drifted from the original pattern of God and therefore has lost its thrust and its vitality, and that the Apostle Paul is doing nothing more than calling us back to that original program. And the church can never recover its strength and never be what it was intended to be in human society until we listen again to what the original program and pattern of God was. And I think we've already seen that if we take this seriously, It means that uh, we shall be involved in some radical readjustment of our ideas. That the church, by and large, must return to the ministry of the people, what Martin Luther called the priesthood of every believer. These are not new ideas. They simply sound new because we've become so accustomed to wrong ideas that we have accepted as being valid and orthodox. And uh, so far have we drifted oftentimes from the original pattern that when it we are confronted with it again, it sounds new to us. Now, we've seen in our studies in this passage that the unique character of the church is not that it should be a pressure group designed to influence legislatures or some kind of... Um, religious club intended to comfort and smooth and assuage the feelings of people in trouble. But the unique character of the church is that it is the body of Christ. And it is called, therefore, as every body is, to declare and demonstrate the life that inhabits it. And that life is the life of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the church is a body whose purpose is to demonstrate and declare the power of Christ in today's world. And the pattern of that function, as we've already seen, is that each unit of the body is to develop and exercise a distinct divinely given gift, or gifts, as in many cases and that these gifts can be exercised in either of two directions, either in the world, out in life as we live it from Monday through Saturday, or in the church, in the among the people of God, also Mondays through Sundays as well, or both. Now, to enable this work to go on smoothly and effectively, It was also in the mind of God that there be a special support ministry consisting of four gifts that are given to uh, smooth out the functioning of the body and make it operate rightly. And these are given to us in this passage we've read. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some teaching pastors. Now, as we are focusing on the details of these gifts and uh, understanding what this equipment is with which God has endowed his body, we must not lose sight of the supreme reason for the manifestation of these gifts. It's in order that the world might see that Jesus Christ is at work. They might uh, come to grips and touch with him not in church. The, it was never intended that the world should come to church. It's that the church should be in the world. And uh, it is only thus that people will understand that Christ is not dead, that he's not gone, that he's not inactive, that he isn't off in heaven some remote place far apart from the affairs of this world and that the church Certain religious people are trying to struggle along and do the best they can until he comes back again. This is never the divine picture. This is not the New Testament pattern. 
Christ is alive, and he's been at work in human society for 20 centuries. Well, somebody says, where? I don't see him. What's he doing? Where do you see Jesus Christ at work in our society today? And what kind of work is he doing? And the answer is he's doing exactly the same thing he did in the days of his flesh. Exactly. The only difference is he is no longer doing it through one solitary physical earthly body. But he's doing it now through a corporate complex body which now exists around the world and permeates and penetrates every level of society everywhere. But it's the same ministry to the same race under the same conditions facing the same attitudes and the same problems as when he was here in the flesh. The only difference is he's doing it through a different kind of body. Now we need badly to understand that concept. That's the church. Well, what is this ministry? Specifically, what is this ministry that Christ is doing through his body today? I'd like you to hear the answer to that from his own lips. One of the most dramatic scenes recorded in our New Testament is found in the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning on this passage, so if you want to turn to it, I think you'll find it instructive. Beginning with verse 16, Luke 4, verse 16. Luke says, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue, as his custom was on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is an account of the return of our Lord to his hometown, where he'd been brought up, to Nazareth. He has been out already in Jerusalem and Judea and in Galilee, in the cities around the Lake of Galilee, with his headquarters in Capernaum. And he has already gained a tremendously famous reputation throughout the land as a doer of good deeds and a worker of miracles. And his fame has preceded him now to his own hometown. Word has gotten back to Nazareth of the strange things that this local boy was doing. They'd heard of his miracles. And now they know that he's come home and that he will be in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the whole town is out to hear him. And they're waiting anxiously hoping that he will do among them some of the miracles that he did in some of these other cities. And he calls for the book of Isaiah, as we've read, selects a passage from it, turns deliberately to that passage from the 61st chapter, reads it, closes the book, and says to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, in me. And his townspeople were aghast. They said to themselves unquestionably, what does he mean? He hasn't done anything yet. How does he mean this has been fulfilled? Why, we expected him to do some miracles. And if you read on, you see that he, knowing this thought was in their hearts, he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. 
what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he proceeds then to remind them that in the whole history of Israel, it has been very common that whenever a prophet comes back to his own country, his own people do not receive him. And he reminds them of two unusual occasions for this. And he is attempting <clears throat> to point out to them that the physical fulfillment of these predictions, the healing of the blind and the opening of their eyes and the healing of the lame and so on, is not the whole fulfillment of this. That God is merely beginning on that level in order that people might, their attention might be captured <clears throat> and helping to move them on to see that he has never accomplished his ministry until he has reached the spirit and the soul of man. And these, this healing ministry has begun in the spirit of man. That's what he's after. These hometown people had their minds set on the physical alone. They wanted to see miracles. They failed to see that the ultimate goal is the level of the soul and the spirit. And that was the mistake of the Jews over and over again in our Lord's ministry. And you remember the apostle tells us this is still the problem with Israel after the crucifixion. The Jews, he says, are seeking after a sign. And all through our Lord's ministry, they hounded him for a sign. They wanted to see physical miracles. That's all. Utterly uh, disregarding what that miracle stood for. As someone has well pointed out, all the miracles of Christ are really parables. They're designed to teach us what Christ is offering to do on the deeper level of the spirit. And these who hunger and thirst for miracles today are repeating this error of Israel. They're wanting always to see something visible, something exciting, something supernatural, they call it. As if a work done in the interior of man's life is not as equally supernatural as something done on the outside. But our Lord is pointing out that the ministry has already been fulfilled, he said to them in their midst, in his presence among them, and that it finds its fullest fulfillment when this takes place, these things that he mentions here, in the spirit of an individual. Now I want you to read through this again with me, beginning with verse 18, this quotation of our Lord in which he describes his ministry as it was predicted by the prophet 725 years before he was born. And read it not now as his ministry then, but as your ministry now. As what Jesus Christ is doing and will do and intends to do through you as a Christian in this, in this mid-20th century. Because that's what he said, remember, in John 14. The works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do. How greater? Well, anything done in the realm of the spirit is greater than that done to the body. Greater works than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. And in other verses, he shows us that his going to the Father meant the sending of the Spirit. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there would be performed in the church throughout the ages far greater works than he did in the flesh because they're the works of the Spirit. Now, let's look at the passage again. Look in detail. There are five divisions of this, of this ministry, and it begins with this phrase, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That means that here is a description of a Spirit-filled ministry. We talk a lot about spirit-filled lives today and the work of the Holy Spirit in the world today. Well, how do you know when the Spirit of God is at work? Is it by some strange uh, phenomenon that takes place? Is it by some miraculous manifestation? 
No, the Spirit-filled ministry will be this kind of a ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's the first thing. To do what? Well, first, evangelizing. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That's the first job. The simple declaring of the story of God's actions among men. That's the evangel. That's the good news, that God has not left the human race to struggle on in, in its frustration and its bewilderment and its boredom and its helplessness and its hopelessness. God has done something. God has entered the race. God has moved. God has gone to the cross. God has delivered mankind. God has, something, has done something, not just said something, he's done something. And those acts stand as unchangeable recorded facts in history. And to tell the story of them is to preach the good news. To whom? Well, not to the rich, to the poor. Well, what does he mean? Does he mean just those poverty-stricken in material things? We're not the rich in wealth, the wealthy to hear this? <laughs> well, obviously, his meaning goes below the physical again, doesn't it? Remember the first words of the Sermon on the Mount? The greatest message ever delivered in the hearing of man. It begins with that remarkable series of recipes for happiness, the Beatitudes. Blessed, happy is the man. And our Lord begins it at that level. Happy or blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed is the man who doesn't have anything and knows it. Doesn't have any kind of standing before God. Doesn't have any long record of good deeds that he's resting upon or any self-righteous attitude, but blessed is the man who comes before God and says, I don't have anything, because God is ready then to give him the kingdom of God. And that's why the gospel is to be preached to the poor in spirit. Don't waste your time talking to people who think they have everything they need. Look for those who don't have. Don't be deluded by the fact that because somebody pretends for a while to have everything that underneath there is not a very hungry heart and get below that. But don't waste your time with people who think they already have everything. Talk to those who know they don't. This is where we start, the declaring of the good news to somebody who needs something. Then look at the second thing. These come together. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. <laughs> release and recovery. Liberty and light. Tell me, are there people who are captives today? Are there people who are blind today? Are there people who are bound with attitudes that just hold them in captivity? And no matter how they struggle against them, they find themselves constantly returning to this same outlook, this same poisonous, hate-filled, jealous, bitter expression. Are they captives? You meet them every week, and so do I. Are there people that are blind? Are there people who think they're doing the right thing? Perfectly sincere, honest people who hope they're doing right and are trying to struggle through the best they can, but every time they turn around, they discover that what they've been doing is wrong, and they end up stumbling blindly from one episode into another, deeper and deeper into difficulty. Are there people that are blind? Well, then they need this, this ministry to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. This is the ministry of teaching. You remember what Jesus said? You shall know the truth, he said, and what? 
The truth will make you free. What sets people free? By telling them the truth. Not telling them what they want to hear. Telling them what they need to hear. Telling them the truth. That's what sets people free. What makes them, what opens the eyes of the blind? The Lord Jesus said, If any man follows me, he shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What's that? Well, that's the ministry of discipling, of getting people to follow, to obey Jesus Christ. Not just to come and sing about him. Not just to come into the church and, 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 and recite the creed or say the right things, but to, to actually obey him when every fiber in their being is crying out to disobey him. But if any man follow me, he will not walk in darkness. He'll know where he's going. He'll know how to get there. He'll know that wh whether what he's doing is right or wrong. He shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. For if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship the one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from all sin. Now you see, this is not just something religious, is it? It's all about life. It's what we're doing every day of our lives. It involves us in our work, in our home, in our school, at shop, at play when we're awake, when we're asleep, in everything we do. This is the ministry that's committed to us. Look at the next one. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is the ministry of healing, of counseling, if you like. Are there oppressed people today? Are there people that are a burden of oppression, a weight in their lives they can't escape? This week I had a man drive 300 miles one way, 600 miles round trip to come and tell me about a burden that was oppressing him for a year, for over a year in his life, been hounded by an attitude in his own heart of hate for a man who had done him an injustice. And he couldn't get rid of it, and he couldn't sleep, and he couldn't eat. And on two or three occasions, he had stopped himself at the moment, at the, at the critical moment from, from committing murder. And it was breaking him up, destroying his house, his home, his family, and his own life. And he came to talk about it. And as we talked together, I set before him the truth. I proclaimed to him liberty to those who are oppressed. And as he acted upon it, there was a miracle performed right before my eyes. I saw a man healed. I saw a burden lifted. I saw the poison of hate drain out of that man's heart. And the love of Jesus Christ come flooding in again. And his whole attitude changed. And he went back home with a different look on his face. And a different look in his heart, a different feeling in his heart. Delivered, set free. Now, it didn't take me to do it. Anybody could have done it. Any Christian could have done it. He didn't have to drive 600 miles in order to find somebody to set him free, or he shouldn't have had to. Any other Christian that knew the, their Bible could have set him free. Because this is the ministry of the gospel. This is the ministry that is committed to every person who is part of the body of Christ to, pro to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And the last one, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's one of the most remarkable statements in the Bible. If you took the trouble to look up the passage from Isaiah that our Lord is quoting here, you discover that, that in, the, in the original passage, there's a comma at this place. That isn't the whole sentence. In the original, it goes on to say, and to, and to declare the day of vengeance of our God. 
But the Lord Jesus didn't read the rest of the sentence. He closed the book right at this point and handed it back to the man and said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. There's some of it that isn't yet fulfilled. Because there's some of it that waits until the return of Christ. That's the day of vengeance. But now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. And do you know there's nothing that people need to hear more than that? That's explaining what's happening in our world. That's relieving the awful cold grip of fear that clutches the hearts of many, many people, thousands today who get up every morning scared to death, not knowing what's happening in the world, afraid it's out of control, afraid that God has lost control if he ever had it, and not knowing what's going to happen. And they need to be set free. They need someone to proclaim to them the acceptable year of our Lord. The fact that God knows what he's doing. And at this day and age, he's permitting the gospel to go out. And he's restraining the forces of evil. And he doesn't let them go only so far. And then he puts a halt to them. He lets certain manifestations come and not others. In order that men might be able to hear this good news. That's the whole explanation for some of these remarkable things that take place. Like in Indonesia, when the communists were all set to take over the government. And suddenly there's a, a, a strange, unexpected, totally unanticipated revolt. And instead of the communists taking over, those who are opposed to communism come in. And nobody expected it. Why not? Why did this happen? Because God is at work in human history. And he is restraining evil forces. And he's permitting it to go so far. He's running it according to his timetable. And today is the acceptable year of the Lord. And it's going to go on until God's timetable comes to an end. And we can set people's hearts at rest by proclaiming this. Are there fearful people today? I don't know anything that's more widespread than fear. This is what is behind so much of the student unrest of our day and the rebellion that comes from the student world. This is a protest against the fear, a fear so disembodied that it creates a sense of frustration, something they can't get hold of but it's driving them desperately to do something, to protest, to strike out, to break out somehow against these silent, invisible forces that threaten them on every side. And you can't understand the student mind unless you understand that. And they're desperately in need of somebody to talk to them about the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, is this a relevant ministry? Is this something the world really needs? Is this just so much mouthing, so much theological twaddle? Or is this something that people are dying and desperate and hungry for today? Well, I'll leave it with you to answer. But if you see it as I see it, you can see this is the greatest thing that anybody can get involved in. The most exciting ministry that you could possibly perform today. You take this list, evangelizing, teaching, counseling, proclaiming the, the times, explaining the times. And you note that you can fulfill that in either one of two directions. You can do it to the world or to the church, and both are desperately in need in this hour. Well, someone says, I can understand how you can evangelize the world, but surely you don't need to evangelize the church. <laughs> There's nothing needs it quite so badly. There are thousands, millions in church who need evangelizing, who even if they have some faint glimpse of the truth, see men as trees walking. You remember that, that 
blind man that Jesus healed, at his first touch, he saw men as trees walking. He couldn't see them quite plainly enough. And our Lord touched him again and opened his eye. Now that's the picture of the, of the Christian in church who needs evangelizing. There are those in the world who need teaching. There are those in the church who need teaching desperately, who need this truth unfolded to them. So it's something vital. It is not just something that they're trying to study on Sundays in Sunday school class as kind of an option to life, but it's the explanation of what's going on in their life. There are those who need healing both in the world and in church. There are those who need the times explained to them in the world and in church. Well, someone says, well, when can you do this? After all, I have to work for a living. I'm so busy at work, I don't have time to go around doing this kind of thing. Well, there's an easy answer to that. Do it at work. Do it in your home. This is something that ought to be as natural and normal a part of life as anything else you do. Obviously, the great majority of Christians spend the greater part of their time doing the work of the world. And this is only right. This is as it should be. Not everybody's called to be a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or a teacher even. The major preoccupation of any man's life is his daily employment. But listen, if Jesus Christ has no part in that major preoccupation of your life, then he's Lord only of the margins, isn't he? The spare time, the leftovers of life. Did you ever notice that the important figures of the Bible are not the monks or the priests that are there? It's shepherds and fishermen and tax gatherers and soldiers and politicians and tent makers and physicians and carpenters. These are the ones who occupy the center of the stage. You can tell the good news about God's actions among men at a water cooler, just talking with somebody over a drink in the office at the water cooler, or over a lunch bucket. Or in a car while you're driving home, you can teach the truth that frees and enlightens someone anywhere. A man, a Christian, told me just this week that he's a member of an urban renewal committee in San Francisco, responsible for clearing up some of the slum areas of, that, of, of the city. And that in meeting with this board, as they were contemplating setting up a new housing project, they were facing the question of what to do with the people who were already there living in, in tenements and flats and slums. And there was a, a feeling of, uh, that's their problem, let them take care of it. But this man spoke up and said, no, it is not. You have no right to put in a, ten a, a housing project in there unless you face the responsibility of helping these people find some other place to live until it's there. Christian compassion, he said, can do nothing less than that. And he insisted on that. And because he spoke up at that moment, he, he, he made the committee face it. And they did face it. And they're moving to meet that problem. You can quiet the fearful with a discussion of the times anywhere. All you need is a newspaper or a headline or something that calls attention to what's happening in the world, and immediately you've got a, a, a wonderful ground to bring up what God is doing in human society and to break through with the good news. Now, I want to return in closing this morning to that story that, with which that was read to us from the Scriptures our Lord's story of the sheep and the goats, the judgment of the of believers. What's the point of that story? Is it not we cannot evade activity? We must put our gifts to work. 
The Lord Jesus Christ has given us a gift to be put to work. We dare not hide this in the ground as that unfaithful steward did in our Lord's parable. Or we must meet him one day with the need for an accounting and a question from his lips. What did you do with the gift that was given you in the body of Christ? Now, I want, I'm trying to face us with the seriousness of this. This is not an option in our life. This is not something we can put aside. This is not something we can lay away until some later hour. This is something that God himself has given us with which we must come to grips and with which we, uh, and about which we must be very, very serious. What have I been given the gift of doing? And where am I exercising it? How am I doing something about this? This is the question we need to face. Our faith means nothing if it doesn't bring us to that place. Shall we bow in prayer? <clears throat> Our Father, thank you for these, these words that remind us that you have not forgotten about this world of ours but are at work in it, doing these same wonderful things that you did back then. What an exciting thing to have a part in this. What a foolish thing that we should withhold ourselves from thee in this ministry and to busy ourselves about doing something for us and thinking about our program and our life and our talents and our abilities when we have the call to invest ourselves in this kind of a, of a program. Lord, help us to mean business this morning as we come to this table and not be so hypocritical that we can take of the Lord's table, which speaks in terms of commitment and availability and readiness to be used and uh, not mean it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
emotions rise My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours And you are mine Your grace about in deepest waters Your sovereign hand Will be my guide When feet may fail And fear surrounds me You've never failed And you won't start now So I'll call So rest in your embrace I am yours And you are mine oh. And you are mine And you are mine oh. Without 
Jesus, you will never fail. 